Now, almost 50 years ago, Kingsley Amis, one of Britain's most celebrated authors, undertook a little-known and unusual project involving tales of sex and torture, a detailed guide on how to drink a bottle of spirits in a day, and why women should never be called Ethel. Comedian Charlie Higson, writer of the Young Bond series, now embarks on a revealing journey with Kingsley's son, Martin Amis, about his father's fascination with James Bond. Democracy is once more in danger as England bravely faces the onslaught of crude sadism. I know only five ways of killing a man with a single blow. The disgusting sex. He was such a credible adulterer himself. The very second-rate snobbery. James Bond would be eating chip butties and smoking woodbine. <laughs> Did Kingsley... You just asked me if Kingsley Ames liked to drink. Yeah, he liked to drink. The martini. To be shaken with ice, not as is more usual, stirred. I'm Hickson. Charlie Hickson. The first film I ever remember going to see in the cinema was Thunderball in the mid-60s, and I was instantly hooked. James Bond seemed to sum up everything that was cool, glamorous, stylish, modern and exciting about that decade. He was the ultimate man. He knew how to wear a suit, drive a car, seduce a woman, kill a man, and order fine wine and food in the most expensive restaurants around the world. I had no idea back then that as a man in my mid-forties, I would be offered the job of writing my own James Bond books about his early years. But back then, when I was a wide-eyed boy sitting in the cinema enthralled by 007's exploits, Another man in his mid-forties was taking a break from his normal career and writing his own Bond books. Kingsley Amos. In the early 60s, Kingsley Amos undertook an unusual project, analysing in detail all of Ian Fleming's James Bond books and compiling a guide for prospective spies on how to be James Bond. Culture. Music. You tolerate cabaret-style voodoo drumming, calypso bands, and, in the company of a girl, La Vie en Rose. You have heard of Wagner. Chat. Master and rehearse the following. For me, the right ingredients of an exciting adventure, of physical exertion, mystery, and a ruthless enemy. Smile when you say this. Done too straight, it might cause an embarrassed snigger. Explaining how, why, and what to wear, eat, drink, and gamble... Kingsley's books about Bond are not only a humorous homage to Britain's most enduring fictional spy, but also a testament to Amos's unlikely obsession with Fleming and his glamorous imaginary world. Smokes. The two basic points are to smoke hard and to enjoy it. Gambling. We will assume by now you've found the right sort of companion. Deal with her by means of any combination of the following. When asked why you aren't playing, say merely that you're after bigger game. Refuse to elaborate. Kingsley's 007 books have been out of print for a long time and are collector's items. In the course of researching my own Bond books, I managed to track down a set and became intrigued as to what had inspired Kingsley to turn his attention to Bond. Why would a celebrated writer stop his personal novel writing to get involved in books denounced in literary circles as pulp fiction? How could one of the original angry young men, known for revolting against the establishment, countenance writing a novel about one of the figureheads of British imperialism? And was Kingsley really the mysterious hand behind Fleming's final Bond novel, The Man with the Golden Gun? To find out more, I met up with Kingsley's son, the writer Martin Amis, in a secret location inside a giant hollowed-out volcano. Actually, it was a recording studio in Soho, and there wasn't a vodka martini in sight. We had nothing stronger to drink than water, neither shaken nor stirred. I wanted to ask Martin about the intriguing relationship between Amos, Amos and Bond. So, Martin, what are your earliest memories of James Bond? Were you a Bond fan as a kid? I remember seeing uh, Dr No, the film, with great excitement in Cambridge when I was about 13 or 14, with a gang of friends and... 
everyone passing cigarettes to each other and uh, real excitement and, and feeling that here was something, you know, incredibly cool and new and grown but, up. And how aware were, were you at the time of your, your father's interest in the whole Bond thing? Well, he kept writing books about it or <laughs> in pastiche of it. And um, he had his big Bond craze in the mid-60s. So I would, be, would have been mid-teens, 16, maybe mm. 17. And uh, actually... To be honest, looking back at them over the last few days, I'm I'm really astonished that the bug hit him so hard. I mean, he was, what, 43 or 4, and that's the time when a novelist is at the height of his energy. And mm. um, to have this three-book divagation from what you would normally be working on, I was just struck again and again by how kind of boyish it all was. Unarmed combat. You can regale your companion, if you wish, with the story of the time you killed the Mexican with a short-arm chin-jab, followed by a hand-edged chop to the Adam's apple. But this might distress her. Better stick to saying modestly at the right moment, I know only five ways of killing a man with a single blow. In the late 1960s, Ian Fleming's Bond novels were selling in their millions, and the films were the biggest thing in the cinema. Bloodthirsty boys like myself couldn't get enough of Bond, but in the more considered literary circles, he was being panned for his sex, snobbery and sadism. I picked up a volume called Dr. No, which I'm told by connoisseurs of his work is not one of his best. It's certainly a very bad novel indeed. And this struck me as a monstrous piece of work. The crude sadism, the disgusting sex, the very second-rate snobbery. It's not even the snobbery of a proper snob. It's the snobbery of an expense account man. In 1958, the journalist Paul Johnson wrote an article suggesting Fleming deliberately and systematically excites and then satisfies the worst instincts of his reader. He seems to have thought this was a bad thing. But Kingsley Amis, stirred by his love of the Bond books, set upon a written defence of the genre. Well, I'd got the idea that Fleming's works were being distorted by the critics who didn't like him, I think, uh, because Bond and Fleming are sort of uh, unthinkingly patriotic and conservative and all that sort of thing, and that's uh, bad, of course, from the point of view of many critics. So they distorted Bond and Fleming, making out Bond to be sadistic and cruel in his dealings with women, which is absolutely untrue. He first started writing about James Bond, I think around 1962 or so. Zachary Leader, Kingsley Amis's biographer. He, his original intention was to write a long magazine article about James Bond, but the article kept growing and eventually turned into the, the James Bond dossier, which was published in 1965. Its idiom is light and playful, but it also has elements of scholarship or pseudo-scholarship or parody scholarship, quite, which are quite funny the number of villains per novel and the number of, of, of heroines per novel and how many fights there are and so forth are carefully calibrated and uh, laid out in chart form and so forth. Title, Dr. No, 1958. Places, London, Jamaica, Crab Key. Girl, Honey Child Rider. Villain, Dr. No. Highlights, Dragon, Nose Establishment, Obstacle Course, Fight with Squid. Title, The Man with a Golden Gun, 1965. Places, London, Jamaica. Girl, Mary Goodnight, though she hardly qualifies. Villain, Scaramanga, though he hardly qualifies. Highlights, none. Kingsley Amis read all 12 Bond novels in one holiday and set about studying and eulogising the formula. The resulting book, The James Bond Dossier, reads like an encyclopaedia of all that makes Bond great and good. Bond's constant cold showers, apart from reminding us of the ritualistic self-dedicatory element in the secret agent's life, also suggest to us that his abilities are acquired, not innate. If we took the trouble to keep fit, if we started the day with 20 press-ups and enough straight leg lifts to make our stomach muscles scream, then perhaps we could vanish an octopus and drive off a barracuda should the occasion arise. The James Bond dossier also offers a defence of the indefensible, such as Bond's attitude to foreigners. To use foreigners as villains is a convention older than our literature. It is not in itself a symptom of intolerance about foreigners. 
where Mr Fleming scores is in having made national prejudices knowledgeable, a new field for the exercise of lifemanship. Thus, it's not the Turks as a whole who are no good, but the Turks of the Plains. Highland Turks are good enough to sit on the Central Committee of Spectre, but there's room for discrimination even here. Any fool can dislike Chinese or Japanese. The smart man's best-hated Asian is the Korean. I asked Martin what he thought about this defence. I mean, I think you'd be hard-pressed now to defend Fleming on the usual pl politically correct you know, vulnerabilities like um, women and race and class. I, I think he, he's very much of his time and of his you know, particular echelon in society. Although, as Kingsley points out, he is pretty well faithful to one woman per book. And Kingsley says that he only pulls one girl per trip abroad, which you know is not uh, yeah. outlandish for a presentable and reasonably prosperous traveller. Kingsley was obviously attracted to the fantastical in fiction, and there was no such thing for him as a guilty pleasure where reading was concerned. In the James Bond dossier, he writes... I think wish fulfilment is a common and normal human activity. No adult ought to feel an adult all the time. Martin Amis. Wish fulfilment, I mean, that, that is the great theme of the interest in Bond. He goes on about how Bond is, in fact, a very uninteresting man, apart from his, what he, when yeah. he's in action. Uh, but that's all right, because we don't want to meet James Bond, we want to be James Bond. He very much left him as a blank slate that we yeah. can project our own fantasies onto. To exactly. But um, I suppose we, do, do you want to be James Bond? I mean... Well, there are some bits of it would be nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, he created this, this sort of ultimate male fantasy figure. He, he's got freedom to do whatever he likes, including killing people. And I think that is, it's a fantasy for a lot of men. It remains a fantasy that I would never act on, of course. In the time leading up to Kingsley Amis writing the Bond novels, he was by his own admission a serial adulterer. He had married his first wife, Hilly Bardwell, in 1948, when she was a 17-year-old art student. But throughout his marriage to Hilly, he was prolifically unfaithful, shocking his friends with the sheer quantity of his affairs. Zachary Leader, Kingsley Amis's biographer. He was very busy during his first uh, marriage. Right up until the early 1960s, um, he was miraculously promiscuous. I want more than my fair share before anyone else has had any. I want to go to every party, drink every drink, go to bed with every attractive woman. And James Bond seemed to have all the things that struck him as pleasurable. I was interested in the connection between Kingsley's love life and his attraction to Bond. Was there an escapist element in all this? In 1963, Kingsley ran off with and eventually married the novelist Elizabeth Jane Howard, whom he had met at a literary conference. But despite this new love, Martin told me the early 60s was a deeply unsettling period for his father. And he said later, divorce is an incredibly violent thing to happen to you. Even though my mother was an extremely pacific woman, it just is violent, getting divorced and leaving your children. Mm. And, uh... Do you think there may have been an element of escaping from all that by writing about James Bond in that sort of very simple, macho world of where you just go off on adventure and shoot people. Yeah, and um, I think that um, sometimes after something like a divorce, you are so churned up that you don't have the access you used to have to your subconscious and that he couldn't do anything more serious than, than James Bond. In 1965, Amos followed up the James Bond dossier with The Book of Bond, or Every Man His Own 007. This was published under the pseudonym of Bill Tanner, 007's fictional chief of staff. A very funny guide to prospective secret agents, it provides instruction on how we average human beings can think, look and act like James Bond. General principles. Show no knowledge whatever of how food is actually prepared. You have never cooked a meal in your life. In your world, a meal appears, is devoured and vanishes. Drama. If you're caught in a theatre, explain you're only there because the man you're following is too. The Book of Bond was, he didn't take very seriously at all, and it was, it was almost, a, in one minor way, it was a kind of family effort in that we'd all sit around trying to make up names for the girls. And um, Do you remember if any of yours made it into the book? 
No, I think one of Jane's did. I think Kestrel Blazer was her. <laughs> we address ourselves here to the female reader. What you're about to learn will enable you to convey quickly to any 007 who may come across you the information that you are a 007 girl. Get yourself an appropriate name. Ones like Pearl and Ethel and Ruby, not to mention Rosa and Irma, are hopeless. Choose one from the following list, or devise your own along the lines it indicates. Kestrel Blazer. Apple Etty. Takata Musk. Aspire Onyx, Calypso Vermouth, Virgo Lupin. As a novelist, Kingsley mainly wrote about what he lived, and while the action sequences played out by 007 couldn't be much further removed from his existence as a writer, he did know something about the drinking and the sex. The Book of Bond gives us occasional glimpses of this, not least where alcohol was concerned. What sort of drinker is a 007? Your daily intake should stay around half a bottle of spirits. This is adequately devil may care without being sodden. If you divide the half bottle into, say, two doubles before lunch, three before dinner and three after, you should run no risk of getting drunk. But Kingsley's Bond books reveal more about the author than just his alcohol tolerance. The meticulous research contained in the Book of Bond and the James Bond dossier belies a very real reverence Kingsley paid to the James Bond novels and genre fiction in general. He felt a sci-fi novel deserved as much serious attention as Milton or Wordsworth. Amos was intellectually curious, interested in breaking down distinctions between high and low culture. Zachary Leader. He was always interested in genre fiction. He thought of uh, this book about Bond, the James Bond dossier, as a way of getting readers to recognize the pleasures that such fiction affords and to see them as, uh, as just one dish in a range of, of fictional dishes available to them. He was terribly concerned about some uh, writers, uh, he would claim of a modernist uh, tendency or, or temperament. The audience is either taken for granted or in some instances he thought of as ignored. A great example that Larkin refers to several times is Miles Davis, a, kind of a jazz modernist you might uh, claim, turning his back to the audience to, to, to play. So, Kingsley was a big fan of genre fiction in general, wasn't he? Why do you think he got so obsessed with Ian Fleming? It's a lasting paradox about Kingsley that um, he didn't like serious or at all highbrow prose. He um, didn't like Nabokov, didn't like Bellow. And he said to me when he was about 60, and he's reading a thriller, and I said, yeah, I commented on it, he said, yeah, I'm never going to read another book that doesn't begin with a sentence, a shot rang out. He said, uh, if it doesn't begin that way, then I'm not interested. In the last few months of Fleming's life, Kingsley was able to meet him and show him the manuscript for his James Bond dossier. To his relief, Fleming approved of his work. But that was the only chance Kingsley had to meet 007's creator. Fleming had suffered a heart attack in 1961, which was followed by a series of increasingly debilitating illnesses. He died in August 1964. After Fleming's death, the publisher, Cape, approached Amos and asked him to look over Ian Fleming's last 007. As any Bond conspiracy theorist will tell you, often at painful lengths, speculation grew about the possibility of a ghostwriter having finished The Man with the Golden Gun. Amos was the prime suspect. No, I don't think he finished it. I mean, I think it was a finished manuscript, as far, so far as I know. Andrew Lysett, Fleming's biographer. Cape, both, I think both Amos's and Fleming's publishers, had got The Man with the Golden Gun, and, and they didn't like it. They, they thought it was weak, not a very good book. So they gave it to Kingsley Amos to see what he could do with it. Kingsley Amos took it on holiday with him to Mallorca. Um, he came up with this idea that um, the villain of the book, Scaramanga, had a homosexual crush on Bond. But eventually, Amos does his thing on it, and, and it gets published. Two years after Fleming's death, the owners of the literary rights to James Bond, Glidrose, approached Kingsley. With his in-depth knowledge of the material, Kingsley was the perfect choice to carry on the Bond legacy, and he was commissioned to write the first post-Fleming James Bond novel. Entitled Colonel Sun, it was written under the pseudonym of Robert Markham, the idea being that a series of authors could all use the same name for further Bond novels and thus avoid confusion. Kingsley Amos. 
a proper writer, a genuine writer, ought to be able to write lots of different sorts of things. From an introduction to the catalogue of an art show to a piece of advertising copy, where it's just not very far. So I have that feeling, but I have also, I think, a justified and uh, useful dislike of repeating myself. And there's nothing to compare for depression when you're reading an author and you say, oh, he's going off into that again, is he? But we heard all about that in the last but one. Colonel Sun is set in the Greek islands, where Kingsley had recently been on holiday with his second wife, Jane. It centres around a Chinese colonel's plot to implicate Britain in a terrorist attack on a Russian conference in Greece, with an attempted murder of Bond and M thrown in for good measure. The novel sees Bond having to collaborate with a glamorous Russian agent. Kingsley hoped that the book might become one of the Bond films. It never did. But the device of having Bond team up with a glamorous female Russian spy did turn up in the film of The Spy Who Loved Me. In this section of the book, M is kidnapped and 007 is lured into a rescue attempt on a remote Greek island. Excellent. Excellent. Mr Bond is with us at last. Bond spoke sharply. Where's the girl who was with me? A very natural question. The Chinese smiled his approval. You needn't worry about her. She has not been harmed, nor will she be, for the moment. Sun's the name. Colonel Sun Liang Tan, of the Chinese People's Army. Fleming put a lot of himself into the books. In many ways, Bond was his alter ego, although I think you can probably read too much into this. As I think in the end, Fleming was a writer like any other writer, and he sat in a lonely room making things up. But nevertheless, part of the joy of Bond is hearing that Fleming voice and feeling that there's a sense of authenticity. You feel that Fleming has lived the life, but Kingsley is probably even further than Fleming from being anything like James Bond. I mean, he couldn't drive a car, could he? No. He was quite nervous of being left alone. Yeah, and he couldn't fly in an aeroplane. <laughs> he could, couldn't even handle the tube. That's not James Bond, is it? I mean, do you think that matters? Do you think that shows in the writing of Colonel Sun? I wouldn't say it showed, but um, it's definitely there. He had his doubts about me as a, a novelist, but he used to admire me for just functioning as a as a human being of you know getting on airplanes and uh running my life he thought that was almost superhuman i remember several times when i was really small i mean six or seven where you'd hear this terrible screaming uh in the middle of the night he described it sometimes as a an attack of depersonalization and very often my mother would lead him in to my room because he couldn't freak out in front of me so it would make help him make a real effort to calm down he had a, an inordinate admiration for for bravery and uh, although bond sweats quite a bit and uh, you know is not immune to fear he he is capable of overcoming that fear in this section of colonel son bond is being distinctly un kingsley like Something fizzed through the air between Bond and Ariadne, knee height, direction ahead. Bond veered to the right, halted in a single stride, went down on one knee, saw the next flash, got in a quick but aimed shot that must have passed no more than four feet in front of Gordienko, heard a muffled cry. When he looked out again, his man was fifty yards away and running hard. Bond didn't waste a shot at such a target. Did you read Colonel Sun when it came out? Yeah. Do you remember what you felt at the time? I felt it was... I actually remember being a little bit disappointed. I I thought he got the the rhythm rather well, and the prose was a little bit better than workmanlike, mm. with occasional striking phrases. But um, I never thought my father was a great plotter. They're all a bit top-heavy in that there's a great deal of explaining to do at the end. Do you, do you think he was perhaps... your father was perhaps a bit too faithful to, to Fleming? But I don't see what the point of it was, really, unless he was faithful. Mm. He wrote a piece defending his decision to do this because, of course, he got sort of sniped at a lot. Um, and he said, I'm doing, it, I'm doing it for the money and jolly good luck to me, he said. <laughs> but I'm also doing it because it's a passion. There's a danger of looking for too much autobiography in Kingsley's writing, particularly in a book as necessarily formulaic as the 007 series. But I couldn't resist asking Martin about a character who his father gave an especially hard time to. 
The one aspect of the kind of Bond mythology that your father clearly hated was the character of M. M is, is very obviously a, a father figure to Bond in the books. Do you think it's telling that in Colonel Sun he has M captured and tortured? <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I do. I think he's uh, working off a grudge there because he, he, he hates M for his, his coldness, doesn't he? He's a sort of stuffy authority figure that he obviously had no time for. Do you think there may have been any kind of guilt on Kingsley's part that he was too much like M himself? Oh, no, he wasn't anything like M. He was actually, by nature, very permissive. And um, if you had a girlfriend around till late and she went to the bathroom and went into their bedroom, Kingsley and Jane's bedroom, by mistake. All you'd get is find a note the next morning saying, does your friend want to stay for breakfast? It's fine if she does, but be discreet with, you know, the cleaning lady or something like that. Um, so he was a warm father, but not as attentive as he might have been. He was the kind of father where you wouldn't see much of him, mm. but every time you did see him, he'd, he'd make you laugh. And that's not a bad father to be. Kingsley Amos obviously enjoyed his holiday with Bond, and I can vouch for the fun to be had being allowed to play in Bond's world. With that in mind, I asked Martin Amos one last question. You yourself have probed contemporary masculinity uh, more than any other British writer, and you've also in your time dabbled in genre fiction. Would you ever consider writing something like a Bond book? If writing is freedom, then you don't want to shackle yourself to existing conventions and indeed you know existing characters if i had a severe brain injury i might uh, <laughs> take it on well that's me told then i'm just off down to the hospital to have a look at my latest brain scans but on the way i will be having a little look at my royalty statements but despite what martin had to say there is a lot to be said for trying something different kingsley was reinvigorated and refreshed by working on his bond novel and then went back to writing more personal books with a new energy and enthusiasm. I have been more effectively ensnared by Ian Fleming's undying creation, and I'm currently writing my fifth young Bond adventure. It seems Bond and I are going to be sharing an office for some time yet. And perhaps, in the end, having fun is the most important thing. Kingsley Amos. Ladies and gentlemen, our national anthem. <laughs> Is that how you'd prefer to be remembered? Would you prefer to be remembered as Kingsley Amos, the, the critic, the poet, the serious writer, or Kingsley Amos, the man who was able to write books that made people laugh? Well, I'd like to be remembered as somebody who it made people laugh. Amos, Amos and Bond was produced by Barney Roundtree and Lucy Ditchmont. It was a Something Else production for BBC Radio 4.